So here's the deal. So here's something, this is brand new. This is gonna be a brand new thing um, that I'm doing tonight. I've never done this before and uh, I'm doing it. So I, I stopped watching all network news about a month ago and this has allowed me to watch and listen even more to informative podcasts, YouTube seminars and interviews, um, et cetera, et cetera. And even with all that, yeah, I know the CDC made another blunder with the release of information related to COVID and how it spreads, and, and then they had to retract it. Yes, I am aware and saddened, and I am, that Justice Ginsburg has passed, so I'm aware of that. I'm just letting you know. I'm aware that the rules change in both the House and the Senate depending on who is president and depending on who's in charge of the House and the Senate. Yes, I'm aware of all that. But, you know, that stuff that I just told you, is it's trickled down to me as what passes for news today. Um, I find toxic to mental health. So I'm just going to allow it to trickle down. Um, that's enough of that. That's ugh, yucky. Um, it is what it is. So I continue to look for the good. I try to find the positive. And uh, as far as information entering my head, I have uh, gone even more so, even though I was a consumer of reading and listening and YouTube, uh, informative YouTube and various podcasts and all that stuff. I've ramped that up even more because I'm just not taking in news from uh, the networks. So instead of that toxic garbage that I just spewed a second ago, I caught one of the things I caught in the past week was a YouTube interview between a, a woman uh, some of you may be familiar with, but whatever. Her name is, uh, she goes by Chef AJ, and she was interviewing two gentlemen, uh, Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. And as I was listening to the interview, a lot of times it's just, I'm just listening in the background, you know, like you guys are me right now, uh, so a lot of you are. Um, I was just listening to it in the background and I'm working and whatnot. And I, I had several instances as I was listening to the interview when I had a dialogue in my head when I was listening to what they were saying where either Dr. Lyle or Dr. Goldhammer uh, was saying something and I just, I wanted to interject what I felt they were both missing. And I'm just like, no, oh, no guys, no, or, you know, you'll see in a minute. But anyway, in my head, this, this was going on and I thought, you know, so I got an idea. I thought, I wonder if it'd be a good idea to share with you guys the clips from the YouTube interview and then my thoughts about what the docs were saying. So you could kind of really get a bird's eye view into when I listened to something like that or this specifically, what was going through my head and can it be used as a teaching lesson and can it be helpful to you guys in a, in a very positive, uh, helpful way? And I think the answer is yes. So I decided on yes uh, to this idea. And I thought it'd be a really good and different way to teach in a hopefully interesting way. So let me give credit here and introduce who Chef AJ is as well as the docs in the interview. Chef AJ is a culinary instructor in Los Angeles who has followed a plant-based diet for more than 30 years. She's the author of Unprocessed, How to Achieve Vibrant Health and Your Ideal Weight. Dr. Lyle has been a clinical psychologist at True North Health Center for over 30 years. He has published numerous articles in the scientific literature. He is the co-author of The Pleasure Trap and is in private practice conducting psychotherapy at the True North Health Center. Dr. Goldhammer is the founder of True North Health Center, a state-of-the-art facility that provides medical and chiropractic services, psychotherapy and counseling, as well as massage and body work. He's also director of the center's groundbreaking residential health education program. He became trained as an osteopathic physician in Australia and promotes doctor-supervised water-only fasting. I think it's good to have a little bit of a background on these people just to kind of know where their tilt is. Uh, True North Health Center was founded in 1984 by doctors Alan Goldhammer and Jennifer Morano. The integrative medicine approach they established offers participants the opportunity to obtain evaluation and treatment for a wide variety of problems. The staff at True North Health Center includes medical doctors, osteopaths, chiropractors, naturopaths, psychologists, research scientists, and other health professionals. The center is now the largest facility in the world that specializes in medically supervised water-only fasting. It's one of the things they do. You can tell they're interested in water-only fasting among the other things they do. The doctors at True North Health Center have extensive experience in the evaluation and conservative management of high blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, and a wide range of other health conditions. Participants come there to fast and detoxify, lose weight, make diet and lifestyle changes, while enjoying a health-promoting diet derived from whole natural foods. The extensive educational program, including food preparation classes with Chef Ramsey's Bravo, make this a unique place to rest, to rejuvenate, and to learn to achieve optimum health. So, 
Doctors Lyle and Goldhammer wrote a book called The Pleasure Trap. The world's shortest synopsis I'm about to give you of The Pleasure Trap is this. Uh, the book absolutely addresses the problems of how we humans evolved on real food and, uh, for eons and for eons where it wasn't real food wasn't always plentiful. Just food wasn't always plentiful. Uh, the book calls the hidden forces in modern life that can undermine our pursuit of healthy and hap happiness and ensnare us in dangerous situations, the pleasure trap. Uh, the pleasure trap is, although I'm oversimplifying for time's sake here, a three-part motivational triad embedded in the genes of every human and complex animal. These mechanisms encourage us to, one, seek pleasure, two, avoid pain, three, conserve energy. And it's primarily this triad, triad of seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and conserving energy that trips us up when we're seeking the achievement of a big goal, especially one that involves addictive substances. Big goals like significant and sustained fat loss require will, uh, will re I'm sorry, they will require the polar opposite of the pe pleasure trap triad. So uh, this is that we'll have to delay pleasure while subjecting ourselves to repetitive pains and we'll have to expend energy rather than conserve it. So everything you see there on the screen, the three, you know, to achieve a big goal, especially a, a goal that involves addictive substances, including uh, junk food and alcohol and so forth, it'll require of us to do the opposite of these three things in the triad of the pleasure trap to be successful. So that's the background on the people involved in this YouTube video and the clips that I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, oh, let me say too that I learned that uh, Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer have been friends for about 50 years. No joke. Uh, true best friends for 50 years and going right now. So it's, uh, even though they banter, um, it's, it's kind of neat to see that they are best friends. They really respect each other. So I'm going to start this off this way. Uh, Dr. Lyle answering a question from Chef AJ where she proposes a truth that people can't get an A body, meaning like, you know, uh, an A grade is great, an F, a F or failure grade is the worst, but people can't get an A body eating a B diet. Yet people still want the A body, so she asks for thoughts from Dr. Lyle. And here's what he said. Let's see if this works. People, a lot of people would have lied to be A students Okay, and of the people that actually were A students, the people that were A students are a small subset of the people that could have been A students. The people that could have been A students were out partying, having dates, okay, and enjoying their existence while they were in college. And the people that uh, could be A students and didn't do that, they are the A students. Okay. So, yes, it's very true. The number of people who can be great, the best, far outnumbers the number of people who become great, the best, in any endeavor. Um, the top 5% are the top 5% more often, not because the other 95% don't have the ability, propensity, or capacity to become a top 5% in the endeavor, but because they are unwilling, for many varied reasons, to do the work required to become a top 5 percenter or as Dr. Lyle was referring to, to become an A student. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so uh, you're absolutely right. If you, uh, if you, it doesn't matter, quote, how much you want it. The truth is, is that you gotta pay the price. All right, so that one's a little bit short, right? But here's the deal, Dr. Lyle says, it doesn't matter how much you want it. That is absolutely false. And that's, you know, when I heard that, I was like, no doc, just wrong. It's just absolutely false. It absolutely 100% matters how much you want it. It 100% matters how much you want it. It's why power over willpower. So where I think Dr. Lyle is misspoken or confused is in the difference between what people often say they want versus how badly they truly want it. Many people give lip service to their goals or intentions. Um, I really want to be thin, somebody might say. So it may seem that the person really wants whatever the goal is, but wanting it isn't, just isn't enough as Dr. Lyle is saying. You know, I think that's what he's saying. I think it's more the lip service part, but to say that it doesn't matter how bad someone wants it is just wrong. Um, but he said it doesn't matter how much you want it, right? So what would make his statement more accurate is this. It doesn't matter how much lip service people pay to saying how much they want something. That's true. 
but it 100% does matter how badly at their core, at the very soul of their being, they really do want it. Because the universal truth is this, if we want it bad enough, we find a way, and if we don't, we find an excuse every single time. Saying how bad you want something may not be the same as how badly you really do want something. Okay, Let's see what's next here. So we'll find out how much somebody really wants something that's difficult to do by how much effort and diligence they're going to put in to do it. And what I will argue is we're going to watch that motivation. The, 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 the world and its data tells us what the story is. And the, the data explains to us that it, for most people, it's not worth it. Okay, that's what it's telling you. All right. I totally agree with Dr. Lyle here. For most people, we can tell how badly they want something by their actions and the evidence of their behaviors. Again, not so much the words. And for most people who say they want to achieve some big goal, in this case fat loss, their actions do not support a belief that they want it bad enough. He's right, it just is, it's just true. Um, it never means they don't want the result. Of course, I would never say, well, that means you don't want the result. And you would say, of course I want the result. Um, but it always means if the behaviors don't match the result they want, that it's not important enough to endure the pain, to go long, to delay gratification, and to consistently perform the behaviors. Okay? Keep going. So it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. Okay, this, is, this is the disgusting uh, explanation that is fed through you know, all kinds of psychological sources. It's like, no, that isn't the reason. The reason is there's a big, massive motivational confusing trap that the that the organism is facing because it's an evolutionarily novel problem and they're not designed to solve it so it doesn't really matter how smart they are it doesn't really matter how motivated they are it doesn't matter about a lot of things it doesn't matter how educated they are okay so there's a couple things to unpack here number one he says we organisms are facing an evolutionarily novel problem He's right, but what does that mean, an evolutionarily novel problem? It means that for eons of time, food was food. It was actual food. That's first. There was no processed food of any kind. And also for eons, food was scarce. Now, most consumables are processed and with chemicals added galore. And this Franken food is abundant for any developed nation. We have access to it 24-7. So yes. We humans are facing an evolutionarily novel problem. In the grand scheme of time, we humans have existed. This is a really new problem. Number two, he says it doesn't matter how smart we are, how motivated we are, or how educated we are. This is where he gets it wrong again. Being smart, motivated, and educated is not a guarantee that one will be successful. Remember, there are lots of potential A students out there who don't get the A grades or A result uh, not because they don't have the ability, um, not because they aren't smart enough or not educated enough, but because their why isn't strong enough. So motivation as evidenced and driven by a killer why is the most important factor. But I'll say too that if you are smart, that will only help. So being smart and motivated do matter. With motivation defined by, defined, uh, by the true why, Again, rather than lip service, being the most important factor and smarts being secondary to the why. Smarts being secondary to the why. Give me, give me a C or D student with a killer why? Give me that any day over an A student with a weak ass why. That C or D student will always do better. Okay? So, onward we go. The truth is it takes an unusual configuration of circumstances to get extraordinary behavior out of an individual to have that kind of success. That's the truth. All right. He talks about an extraordinary configuration of circumstances to get the behavior out of someone to get the results most say they want. Well, I'd again say it's less about circumstances and more about what? The why. But I will agree with what I believe his notion is that it'll be a small percent of people who will reach the summit of the mountain. 
uh, those who do are truly extraordinary in that they are in the top 15 to 20 percent of those who say they want a healthy fit body and of course the ones who end up achieving the fittest bodies are in the top one to five percent of those who say they want to achieve it and give it at least some effort to achieve it okay um, it is more rare than not that people are successful and it is even more rare for the ones who achieve the fittest bodies absolutely it's absolutely true but I'd, I'd argue it's very uh, similar to any endeavor that is difficult and that requires sustained effort over months and years. And I want to say this too. Why am I giving you this news that it's only at best around 20% who will get anywhere near the summit and only 1% to 5% who will truly reach their summit of potential? Because I want you to know that you need to be real about the challenge before you. Always, we've got to stay real about this. We've got to have our head in the right place. We've got to give this the attention and the focus and the seriousness that it deserves to get to where we really want to go. This isn't something you can just kind of push off and give it a little bit of attention every so and so. You got to really focus in on, uh, on the goal and you've got to apply everything uh, that I'm teaching throughout the program to really be able to reach that summit. To at least get to be one of the 20% who gets uh, closer to the summit and then if you really want to be fit and have the, the, the bang in body, then you're in that, in that one or five percent then you're going to have to really, really step up. So I just like to make sure that, that, we're, that we're real about it, but it certainly can be done. Um, it isn't just some, well, you know, just eat less and exercise more thing and yeah, it, it'll work out. No, it just doesn't work that way. No, you won't. But even though I share the more bleak news about success rates, I hope you're hearing me loud and clear that it's far less about your ability or potential and far more about it being your why, driving consistent behavior, supporting goal achievement. Your why, driving consistent behaviors, supporting goal achievement. And what are our behaviors? Behaviors, behavior is mind driving body in fulfillment of dominant thought. Thoughts are things, and it all starts with our persistent thoughts. Okay, so. The other yeah, side of this, though, is that in order to really evaluate whether or not the price is worth the benefit, they have to get to the benefit. So here's my problem is they say, well, the price is huge, and we agree, it's huge. The price of living healthy in a world designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable, tremendous effort, maybe beyond many people's uh, current you know, capacities. Uh, the more motivated they are, obviously, the higher percentage of people are able to have a, have a fighting chance. Sure. But until people get a chance to see the benefit and get used to it and stop paying such a huge price that you pay initially, they sure. can't really properly evaluate, is it worth the effort? Like the people that manage to get there rarely come back and say, well, you know, I lost all that weight. I recovered my health. Ah, it's not worth the trouble. All right. So Dr. Goldhammer there so correctly says that the price of success as we're climbing the mountain of fitness is huge. The price is huge. It takes a lot of effort, especially early on, but also uh, even with some experience at various points as we climb the mountain and are faced with uh, different terrain, weather, physical breakdowns. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got you just all, you know, hopefully imagining we're, we're climbing Mount Everest and we're, we're going to summit the mountain. So, you know, when you start off on the climb, it's very hard because you didn't know anything. You didn't know how to climb. You were new to it. Lots of things going on, lots of fears, lots of things to overcome to get started. But as you, as you continued up, um, you were also faced with terrain changes and weather changes and body physical breakdowns and things like that. Just apply any of those things metaphorically to just things that happen in our lives that, that can be uh, troublesome. He says, Dr. Coldhammer says, the price of living healthy in a world designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable requires tremendous effort. That's a great quote. The price of living healthy in a world designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable requires tremendous effort. He's absolutely right on that. Um, but I'd say it's harder in the beginning, okay? Um, it gets easier along the way, but can be hard at various points, as I just said, along the way too, no doubt. But with the consistency, if you're consistent, it does get easier, and over time, it can get to the point where the effort actually feels quite minimal. Maintenance, always remember, is not the absence of action. Maintenance is just a lower intensity of action. So when he says it requires tremendous effort, it doesn't require tremendous effort forever. It doesn't require tremendous effort when you get to maintenance. It doesn't necessarily require tremendous effort after even a few weeks or maybe a month of doing things consistently well 
after you've been taught and trained how to do things consistently well and how to put all the pieces in place with your nutritionally fit, uh, actively fit, and emotionally fit lifestyle. So it does require tremendous effort at points, a lot of times very early on in the start, um, and sometimes in the middle and sometimes at the end. Um, sometimes when you're in maintenance, you'll have a period you're like, holy crap, I was in maintenance, it was going along smooth, and now I'm going to have to apply tremendous effort again. That's true, but it isn't tremendous effort all the time. That's what I wanted to make the distinction on. And he finished this section that I showed you by saying the problem as he sees it is most people never get to the point where they experience their highest potential and thus never really get to experience all the benefits um, and really see just how good it is to feel their best. In other lessons, I've said when we start uh, and along the way, but before reaching the summit, we can envision in black and white what it might feel like to reach our highest potential, but it's not until we've achieved it Okay, when we've really achieved our highest potential and are living it in high definition color instead of black and white, that we really understand just how good it is. There are certain things you can imagine on day one. Oh, it'll be so good to be able to, bear with me, fit, fit uh, properly in, a, in an airplane seat. But you couldn't picture that you wouldn't hear the swoosh of your pants rubbing against each other as you walked. And that was a really cool thing when the swoosh of your pants rubbing against each other stopped. You couldn't think of that on day one because you were seeing things in black and white. And when that, those little things happen, and then all the other amazing things happen when you actually get there and you can see it in high definition color, it's a different animal that's really, really tough to perceive and imagine when it's day one. It's almost impossible because there are so many things that come out that you couldn't envision. So in that regard, I do agree with him partly that for the people who never reach the summit, they have a really hard time or can have a hard time because they don't know exactly what it's like. They can kind of picture it, sometimes picture it, sometimes they can't even picture it, but it's not necessarily ever as good or as clear or as in color um, as when they're actually there and living it. Um, so it's not until we've achieved it and are living in high definition color that we really understand just how good it is. So I do agree with him that it's uh, really rough to understand how good it is when you've never really been to the promised land to the summit. I do agree with that. Um, I also want to say too, and I just thought of this, didn't even have this in my notes. When you get to the summit, your personal summit, whatever that is, there's something you know really cool. And I, I say this, I, I like you guys to at least lose enough fat and, and perform in, in, all the other, in all the variety of ways with exercise and things, putting on muscle, losing fat, so that if you're 300 pounds and you lose 10% of your body weight, that's great. And I really mean that sincerely, okay? I really mean that. It's great. It's 10% of your body weight. 30 pounds, 10% of your body weight. Medically, it's fantastic for you. You're going to reduce inflammation. You're, you've got things moving in the right direction. Um, so many good things can come from that, just doing that. If you never lost another pound, you, you, just, you never got below 270, it would be so much better than being at 300. However, would it feel good enough for you to defend it? And by defend it, um, I mean you won't relinquish it. You, you're going you're gonna to keep working. It feels so good. I'm going to, I'll move a mountain. I don't care what I've got to do. I'm going to defend this position, this new good position I'm in. Would we say that for most people who are 300, who get the 270, that it is so good at 270 that it's worth defending with their life, worth, worth going through the hardship and the pain and the struggle that it'll take to continue on the process, even to maintain 270? Um, I'm going to say no. And that goes from just 30 some years of experience and, and, and all the people I've worked with. It varies for, for different people, but I, I don't see anyone that is, feels that, oh my gosh, this is so good, you know, uh, if I'm, you know, whatever. Let's say, let's say your ideal weight is 130 and you started at 180 and now you're 162. You again, lost 10%. So you're 162, your ideal is 130. Is 162 going to be something you're going to want to defend with con just tremendous effort because it feels so good. You'll never let, you'll never want to let it go. I'm again going to say probably not. So there's some percent, there's some place between wherever you started and the promised land. If you, even if you don't get all the way to the promised land, there's some point in there where in, in my goal for all of you is to get to wherever that point is, at least get to there. If we can get to the summit, great. 
But even if we were a little bit short of the summit, if we get to the point where you've gotten, you feel so good, you've noticed such a dramatic change in so many different areas that are positive that you will defend it. It's so good, you will defend it. And it, that part kind of goes along with Dr. Goldhammer in that he's saying that, you know, if people don't ever get to the summit that they don't know how good it is and they uh, don't know that, you know, that they don't necessarily find it worth the effort to continue. So what I'm saying, it kind of really builds on that in a very significant way, in a very different way than, than what he said. But it, it's, it is important to at least get to the point where you're at that place where you, you're like, I will never let this go. This feels too good. I'm going to defend this. I will do the actions. I will eat shoe leather if I have to. I will set alarms. I will do anything I have to do that's legal, ethical, and moral to make sure that I defend this position or continue on. But I'm not going backwards because this feels too good. That's my goal for all of you with regard to that topic is getting you to whatever point that is for you where you, you do say, I will defend this. All right, let's keep going. Because uh, Dr. Lyle is about to counter what Dr. Goldhammer said. Oh, they do, sometimes Alan. They do. They wait, time out. Yeah, they do sometimes it all the time. they do. No, no, it isn't sometimes. It's the vast majority. Now, what they don't say that, but their behavior tells you that that's precisely what happens. Well, it's because they haven't gotten to the point where they get the benefit without such a huge price. Not true. Okay. This is, uh, this, you're now not understanding what you're saying. You've had a lot of people that might lose 40 pounds and they look great. And then we see them three years later and they put back 25 pounds. What took, what took place? They did do it well. They did it exceptionally well. They got excellent results. Now, if you were to say to them, do you like these results? They'd say, oh my God, these results are fantastic. I'm so happy about it. Would you want to keep these results? Of course, I'd like to keep these results. How come you didn't? The answer isn't because that they, that they didn't understand the benefit. They did understand the benefit. But the truth of the matter is, in the face of the pleasure trap, in the face of the pleasure trap, they ran on a daily and hourly basis the cost-benefit analysis of continuing to do that decision-making pattern, and they didn't do it. All right. So Dr. Lyle says that people do get to the promised land, even if infrequently, but they are saying with their behaviors after they get there that it wasn't worth it. Um, that even when they experience the summit and can live it in what I describe as high definition color that I've been talking to you about, that it's not enough to overcome the pleasure trap. And keep in mind though, that Dr. Lyle's lens that he filters this part of the world through is that the people are in the pleasure trap and it's this pleasure trap that causes them to lapse or relapse. Remember the pleasure trap as Dr. Lyle defines it uh, is that we humans are hardwired to seek pleasure, avoid pain and conserve energy. And it's this triad that Dr. Lyle uses to explain uh, almost entirely why people, one, fail to achieve their goals, and two, relapse once they've achieved them. And Dr. Goldhammer stands firm that it's just that the people haven't reached the summit to know what it feels like. Okay? So then Dr. Lyle says that if we asked people if they liked the results when they've reached the summit, they'd say they love them and they want to keep them. So then he says again, 100% filtered through the explanation he gives for all success and failure, that, that is being the pleasure trap, that the reason people who get to the summit then lapse or relapse is due to overwhelming forces of the pleasure trap. That is, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain, we conserve energy. So here's what I think is interesting. I agree with Dr. Goldhammer that it's hard to keep consistent motivation when you haven't really, again, lived the summit lifestyle or at least gotten to the point, as I said a bit ago, where it's so good it's worth defending. Um, when all you've ever done is been able to picture it in black and white instead of living it in high definition color, but I don't agree that it's the reason for the lack of success. Again, I'm disagreeing with Dr. Goldhammer that it's, that's not the reason for a lack of success that people just haven't gotten to the summit. It may contribute, but it's not the biggest factor. The biggest factor is the why, it just is. Next, I agree with Dr. Lyle that people do get to the summit, and most will lapse or relapse to some degree. Obesity is a chronic relapsing condition. And I agree to an extent that the triad of the pleasure trap, that we seek pleasure, avoid pain, and conserve energy, can contribute to a relapse. But I disagree with him that people run a daily, this is big, this is a big di disagreement here, uh, uh, 
by me of, of him. I disagree that people run a daily and hourly cost-benefit analysis on whether it's worth staying at the summit. No, they don't. What happens far more often is amnesia, coupled with taking where they are for granted. Uh, they stop being grateful for where they are, for all the work they put into achieving the summit, and getting all the benefits of living there. They forget all they went through to get to where they are. If people did do a daily cost-benefit analysis, as Dr. Lyle says they do, I believe they'd be more successful, not less. In essence, what I'm saying is people stop appreciating where they are and what they are living. So the person at the summit doesn't get there and go, eh, my behaviors, eh, it's just not really worth it. They aren't thinking enough about it. They stop appreciating where they are and what they are living. And when that happens, the universal law of gratitude just does what it does, as it's always active and present whether we're aware of it or not. And this universal law of grat gratitude says, whatever we are proactively grateful for um, grows, and whatever we are not proactively grateful for dwindles or dies. Proactively grateful. We can't wait to feel gratitude. We have to proactively be grateful. We have to put out energy to be grateful. We have to be thinking proactively toward gratitude. So when you get amnesia, you forget what got you to where you are. And you stop appreciating all of the factors that helped you to get where you are. You stop appreciating the good of where you are. The benefits of your hard work up to this point, whatever point that is. Then your ability to stave off the pleasure trap we want to go that direction for Dr. Lyle. Your ability, once you've gotten the amnesia and you've gone into a lack of appreciation um, and some cockiness to it, I'll talk about in a second. Once that's gone on, then your ability to stave off the pleasure trap and other factors always trying to draw you back to your formerly unhealthy self, they grow stronger. All those pressures grow stronger. But it's because, not because you're running a daily and hourly cost-benefit analysis of where you are. Uh-uh. It's because you're forgetting where you are and what it took to get you there. And you stopped appreciating what got you there and all the benefits of where you are now. And you've probably gotten cocky, too. You aren't proactively grateful for living at the summit. So the awareness of the benefits dwindle and you begin to lose it. Okay? The awareness of the benefits dwindle and you begin, therefore, to lose it. It's a universal law. Had you been more proactively grateful, that's why I'm telling you this, because if, if you're hearing me, then you've got an opportunity to get or remain proactively grateful. But had you been more proactively grateful, ideally each day, not only of the benefits you are experiencing in the now and all that went into helping you get uh, where you are, I propose that even with the pleasure trap that Dr. Lyle espouses, you would be far more likely to retain the benefits and continue living at the summit. It's far more about remaining grateful for where you are and the incredible work it took to get uh, where you are than, as Dr. Lyle says, people achieving the summit, but you know they get to the summit, but just realizing with daily cost benefit analysis that it's just not worth it. No, that's not right, that's not true, that's not accurate at all, it's just not. Sometimes they don't do it though because they've gotten out of pain so their motivation yeah. is gone. And totally. now it's like, well, now that I don't have pain, I wouldn't mind having a little of this and a little of that. And at it first, they get away with it. Yeah. Because you know, they're doing pretty well. And okay, so maybe they didn't maintain all the weight loss, but eh, I feel pretty good. And then slowly but surely, they start getting symptoms back. And before long, then you get the call which says, I think I'm ready for another chance, another round. A uh, total agreement. But uh, my point is to understand what's actually happening there. All right, so Dr. Goldhammer was discussing what I referred to as food creep, but this uh, slow slip back to the former unhealthier self can uh, manifest by allowing junk food back in little by little and also by reducing exercise little by little. Uh, the junk starts to creep in, usually quite slowly and insidiously. Uh, anybody who's done this at all for any length of time knows exactly what I'm talking about, that slow, insidious creep back in of the junk. It was out of your cupboards, it was out of your car, it was out of your workspace, and now it's back in there. And then also you start missing those promised workouts again. Okay, you start missing, yeah, I'm gonna promise I'll do it tomorrow, and you start missing that again. It starts to creep back into the old unhealthy habits. It's the notion I refer to that we're all asking ourselves one or more times a day, can I get away with it? Can I get away with it? And what I propose is no matter what level of progress you've achieved, 
whether you're at the summit or you just lost your first 10 pounds, there are three primary factors why food creep and less exercise insidiously return. Three reasons why that happens. Number one, a lack of gratitude and appreciation for where you are and what it took to get you where you are. Number two, too little focus on your why for progressing or uh, your why for maintenance, whatever that may be. And three, you got cocky. Um, this one, number three, it's so common, it's mind-blowing. Remember, my view on this goes respectful fear, good. Confidence matched with humility, good. Cocky, very bad. Dr. Lyle, of course, would explain the slow slip back to the unhealthy self as almost an inevitable because of the pleasure trap. I wouldn't say the triad of seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and conserving energy aren't always present. I'd agree with him on that. That's the pleasure trap. But I'd say the three reasons I just gave, gratitude, why, not being cocky, provide a strong and all but guaranteed counter to the pleasure trap, and it's why some people do get to the promised land and stay there. Uh, when I'm focused on any kind of problem solving, the, the thing that I'm most focused on is what I call esteem processes. So I'm really trying to get away from, gee, how good was the result? I'm trying to actually get people to pay attention to the internal process that takes place on a daily basis when their internal audience observes that they have done behavioral excellence. This is what I call self-esteem. So this is why I have a website, Esteem Dynamics, and all kinds of videos on there uh, trying to explain that you can get distracted from the most important success thread that exists. And that success thread is what does it feel like inside to do it well and do it properly? Not once you've reached some top of the mountain place, but in fact, in the process of doing it extremely well, the feeling that your internal, but the problem is that voice is quiet. And it's actually not nearly as loud as the evolutionarily novel, uh, super normal feedback that you're going to get from some shit that you're going to eat. So you, you have to be aware of that feeling of behavioral excellence and essentially get quietly addicted to it, of uh, the feeling. And that, that's what I want people to focus on more than anything else. All right. Now, this part from Dr. Lyle, I can really get behind. In other lessons, I've shared the idea of replacing the habits of failure and missing goals with the habits of success and goal achievement. And honestly, uh, either can be quite addictive. Either can be quite addictive and repetitive. If you've gotten into the habit of saying you're going to do something and not doing it, if you've gotten into the habit of setting a goal and letting it pass without achieving it, these behaviors hurt quite a lot the first time you do them, but they hurt less and less and just become more your standard operating procedure when they are repeated over time. If this is your pattern, I could ask you how it feels, and you might say, not good, but eh, it seems to be what I do. But when you replace the failure habits with success habits and you consistently honor yourself by doing what you say you will and making sure most goals you set are achieved, you can create a new chain, a new pattern, a new consistency that can become just as addictive as the old pattern. And for the people who consistently do honor what they say, they will do, um, the people who do honor more consistently what they say they will do and who do consistently achieve goals they set, if I ask them how it feels when they miss the rare goal or don't follow through on what they say they will do, they will be more likely to say, it sucks. It hurts a whole hell of a lot. So Dr. Lyle says it, this way as he refers to this process as an esteem process, as in something that supports self-esteem. He says, we should be aware of that feeling of behavioral excellence and essentially get quietly addicted to it. I like that phrasing a lot. I really do. Let me say it again. We need to be aware of that feeling of behavioral excellence and essentially get quietly addicted to it. That's good. You know, we've had a number of patients, particularly this year, that have been at the extent, uh, center for many, many months. Some yeah. of them came in quite ill. Some of them came in with great goals, you know, large goals that they wanted to overcome. Right. And I've really noticed over the years that people that are at the center for a while, it gets easier and easier as they get into the habits and they have support and there's no temptation. And then occasionally when they go home, they get into struggles. So what yeah. we're thinking is maybe we need to stop that and just not have them go home anymore. And right. they have these problems because it's not the food that's the limiting factor. When they're eating the food and there's no temptation, they're doing fine. And they get the right. results that are predictable. But when they go home and they're around all, the pleasure trap and these social things and all that other stuff, yeah, yeah that's where the real battle begins. Yeah. So, but the point is people think it's the food that's the battle. 
And I can tell you from looking at people that do struggle in the real world, don't have that much trouble when all of those channel factors and all the social tension systems are reduced. It's not like they're, oh, they just can't stand it because the food, no, it's the circumstance. The so like, I think you're right. We've got to change the environment, not worry about changing our personality. Okay, that was the last one. So let me just talk about that. So Dr. Goldhammer gives a tongue in cheek ha ha statement that since people can do well while at his inpatient center, uh, but it's when they go home, that's where the problems begin again. Maybe we should just not let people go home. He says it's not the food that's the limiting factor. It's the circumstances for the people when they are at home. Um, I want to make a quick distinction here. It's not, again, not in my notes, but it's, it just popped into my head. It's, I disagree with him. It's not the circumstances per se that are the problems when people get home. It's an underdeveloped and immaturity to emotional fitness muscles that need to be developed to be able to withstand, champion, and overcome the circumstances that everyone's going to face when we're living out here in the, in the free world and we're not at a facility, okay? So I don't disagree at all that life on a daily basis provides challenges that range from minimal to catastrophic. It just does, right? But every single day we are all faced with some level of challenge. And I don't think it's as much the life circumstances, but rather, as I said, the level of emotional fitness we're at uh, to be able to better manage life. It's what emotional fitness allows us to do. It allows us to better manage life um, instead of trying to cure life. It sounds like his patients often do, often do well while inpatient at his facility, much like the contestants on The Biggest Loser did while on the ranch, right? But when they had to go back to the real world and face the realities of everyday living, their emotional fitness wasn't always strong enough and their why wasn't always strong enough to be able to keep them performing uh, the behaviors for lasting success. So it's important I say that we should always be working on strengthening our emotional fitness muscles to become better life managers so that life circumstances don't completely derail us from our greatest ambitions, okay? And I disagree with him that it's more the life circumstances rather than the food, because he says it's not so much the food, it's the life circumstances that throw them into relapse once people have left his facility. I'm going to say this, it's both. Well, I'm going to say that it's the emotional fitness plus the food. Um, it's that's uh, disrupting uh, the behaviors that are going to continue to support the healthy lifestyle that they started the game while they were at the facility. It's both. When emotional fitness isn't ideal, when the why isn't really strong, and the circumstances feel too overwhelming, the self-destructive but familiar behaviors that have provided relief, escape, and reward and celebration return. They return when the circumstances feel overwhelming because our emotional fitness muscles are, are underdeveloped or too immature still to be able to manage life and the circumstances that everyday life is going to throw at us all. But the two, the emotional fitness slash circumstances, ability to handle circumstances and, and food are absolutely interconnected. Doing what we can to control our environment is wise. It is. Um, and when I say control the environment, that's where I'm talking in his language about circumstances. Um, not purposely subjecting ourselves to temptation is smart. Setting up our home, car, and workplaces to keep triggers absent and out of sight. That's smart. Creating support, habits, and reminders for exercise consistency are highly advised. Surrounding ourselves with like-minded people in a group like ours is smart. After all, we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. Remembering and practicing the emotional fitness lessons and universal laws about focus, gratitude, and serenity are paramount to success. But on top of all these circumstantial things, if we continue to eat things that are triggers, there's no chance of reaching the summit. Or if you've reached the summit, there's no chance of staying there. So, so as not to end on a negative. That means, based on what I just said, that the converse is true. So what's the converse? If we do the circumstantial things that I talked about, setting up our environment for success, the things I just mentioned, so we can live in the real world and not have to be inpatient at a treatment center, and we practice our version of abstinence that gets us the results, a results-based abstinence program, as part of the program, like I've taught you guys here, if we avoid the triggers, um, then we can reach the summit and we can live there. Um, we can experience the freedom we desire forever. 
even with whatever life circumstances will be coming our way because we will be more emotionally fit. We will be able to manage life better. And by keeping the trigger, junk, alcohol, whatever out of our, out of our life, and practicing the form of abstinence that works for us based on results, uh, because we're doing that, we can uh, be successful forever. And we can do so not by in some way avoiding the pleasure trap that Dr. Lyle espouses, but by overcoming its ever-present force uh, with an even mightier collection of forces working for our benefit. So we're kind of, you know, it's force against force. If we, if we believe that... Uh, that we are in the pleasure trap, that we all have this thing that Dr. Lyles coined as a pleasure trap, that we avoid, uh, we seek pleasure, avoid pain, and, and work to conserve energy. And we've got to have forces that will allow us to uh, continue to counter that. And the things I've just mentioned are those things that can and will counter that. If we think about it, it's how anyone who has championed fat loss and maintained it has done it. Everyone has had to deal with life stressors, circumstances, uh, but the ones who were ultimately successful were able to stay focused on the long-range vision in spite of the pleasure trap triad or the many other force, forces trying to draw them back to where they started. And those forces are real. They're, they're with us all the time. Um, I, don't, I can't, don't have it quoted, but you know what um, Dr. Goldhammer said uh, relating to um, how uh, we've got these tremendous forces working against us and it's going to take tremendous effort to counter those forces in our modern society. That's always true. But the things I've talked about tonight and the things I continue to teach and the very comprehensive nature of all I teach are the things that can counter that, counter, whether you call it a pleasure trap or whether you call it life circumstances, call it whatever. Um, we can counter those things. And uh, anyway, that's, that's my take on that. Um, let's see here. <laughs> 